You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask a Gettysburg Guide number 15, Bob. Wow, Matt. Unbelievable. 15 times we've been this stupid to be this <laughs> cold sitting out there. Here it is, May. What is it, 15th today? Yeah. And we're still freezing, Matt. Yeah, I, you know, and the fork we chose today because the forecast was saying it was going to be up in the 70s. And and this morning it was nice. And I go, oh, this is great. We finally have a break with the weather. And then as, literally, I said this to Roy, uh, like uh, like a half hour before we started, uh, when we started, we're setting up here, the clouds come rolling in. Yes. And now it's cold and windy. And I have shorts on and so does Eric. And we're freezing. Yes. And we're going to get hypothermia. Anyway, today we're talking uh, f- to you from East Cemetery Hill, uh, right behind the Howard statue. There's a big old craggly tree, and uh, we're sitting underneath it. Um, and we're going to be talking about the National Cemetery. And so we brought in the expertise of Roy Frampton. Hello, Roy. How are you? Cold. Yeah. <laughs> well, but so, hanging in there. Good. Well, uh, thank you for doing this. Roy, tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been guiding? <laughs> um, well, I guess I'm the old timer. I started um, 1968. Oh, jeez. Two weeks out of high school. Wow. Really? Yep. So this, if I, if I even get any tours in this year, it'll be 52 years. Wow. And, and uh, what was the guide exam like back then? What'd you have to do? Uh, not as complicated as it is today. Uh, you would take the written examination. Uh, we usually took it. We took it that time at night, and then after about oh a month or so, then they called me up for the oral examination. Okay. That was it. Okay. Which is ba- that's basically the way it was until only a few years ago, right? Correct. Right. Okay. All right. And um, so uh, also we have Tim Smith with us. Hello, Tim. How are Hello? you? Hello. And uh, we're going to get into questions that the audience sent in about the National Cemetery. So let's get started. Uh, Veronica Brzezinski says, I'd like to know the story behind the UC or USCT graves there. How many are buried there? How did the burials come about? My understanding is that they were not initially welcome or inc- welcomed or included. Is that right? Are they just local men? That kind of info, please. So, Roy, what do we know about the USCT? First of all, uh, USCT stands for United States Colored Troops. Right. So that's what uh, she's talking about there. Um, and go ahead. Yeah, she mentions, well, first of all, there's a fallacy that um, the National Cemetery was never segregated. There was no policy of segregating, you know, uh, limit, uh, not allowing blacks, African Americans to be buried in the National Cemetery. So that rumor that has spread around, that's totally false. So you're saying the fallacy was that they that it was segregated? Yeah. Okay, so it was never segregated. Never okay. segregated. Gotcha. Never was. Um, and I got a list. Hey, I did my research. Good. <laughs> uh, they are... Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, African Americans that are buried basically in the Civil War section. Okay. You want me to go through them? Sure. Oh, okay, okay. The The first one is Henry Gooden, and he's in the 127th U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, he is a Pennsylvanian, didn't see any action in the war. He uh, spent most of, the, of his service down in Texas. I think herding cows. I think that's what he was doing. Okay. Uh, But he lived in Carlisle. He died in 1876. And then he was reburied here in the Gettysburg National Cemetery in November of 1884. Okay. So he's the first African-American buried in the National Cemetery. And yeah, he is a Civil War veteran. But that's 1884. Okay. Uh, Then you have Clifford Henderson... Emmett Martin, and Nicholas Farrell. Those three African-Americans are buried in the Ohio section. They are not Civil War. The Spanish-American. All three of them belong to the 9th Ohio Battalion, and all three died in Camp Mead, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, of disease. So why are they in Ohio? 
they were from Ohio. Okay. Gotcha. Right. So they were originally from Ohio. They enlisted um, at the beginning of the Spanish-American War. Their unit, the 9th Battalion, was stationed in Harrisburg and not quite sure what illness got them, probably typhoid, uh, but all three of them died. Um, Henderson died in um, September 1898. Martin died November 1898. And Pharrell died in also in November of 1898. I guess really my question is, if there is Spanish-American War, why are they in the Civil War section? That's a question I really can't answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I didn't mean to stump you. At that, no, at that <laughs> time, 1898, the, the semicircle, which is the Civil War, is really basically the only place where they were burying dead. Okay. There are a few just outside the circle. Uh, but in 1898, they're basically still burying people within the semicircle. And those are not the only Spanish-American War burials within the semicircle. Correct. There's one, two, three, four more of them. And one of those is um, Harry Prager, 2nd Tennessee, which is also a black unit. Okay. And he's also Spanish-American. In fact, he got, um, he contracted yellow fever in Cuba. And they shipped him up here to Harrisburg, and he died also in Harrisburg at Camp Mead. Huh. All right. So there are several blacks in the National Cemetery. It was never segregated. The last one that is Civil War related is Charles Parker. He's buried outside the semicircle. And he, um, he was from New York, died in 1876. But then his body was transferred to the National Cemetery in 1936. Okay. So I, I guess uh, really I should have asked you this first here. The National Cemetery itself. Yep. Uh, let's get into a little background on how that came into existence. Okay. Um, so the, the battle occurs. Then what? <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, p take yourself back to 1863 in July. And you lived here. Bodies are everywhere. You can't walk anywhere. You know, there's bodies sticking up out of the ground, um, temporarily buried. You got to find a place to put the dead. Uh, so I'm going to ask Tim. Who's the um, father of the Gettysburg National Cemetery? Well, I guess we would say David Wells. Correct. But who comes up with the idea? Well, um, you know, the idea for the cemetery actually started even before the battle. David McConaughey, who was the president of the Evergreen Cemetery in 1862, actually proposed uh, a plan whereby the cemetery association buy a separate piece of land near the Evergreen Cemetery or next to it and established a cemetery for soldiers from Adams County that had been killed during the war. And that plan sort of resurfaced immediately after the battle. And on July 23rd, they had a meeting up at David Wills' house on the square. And a man by the name of uh, Theodore Diamond is actually the man that proposed uh, establishing a separate burial plot uh, space for all the dead of the Union Army. So it's Theodore Diamond also that uh, now he was a contractor from New York and Massachusetts. He was sent down here to Gettysburg to find a burial place predominantly for Massachusetts soldiers. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's where the cemetery idea comes from. And of course, as I said earlier, we're sitting here on East Cemetery Hill. This is where the cemetery was supposed to be. At least this is where David Wills wanted the cemetery to be established. But it's McConaughey that, <laughs> that threw a monkey wrench into everything, buying up the land, and writing the governor of the state, and it took a while, but finally the 18 northern states involved in the establishment of the cemetery and the governor of the state put the pressure on, and the townspeople put the pressure on McConaughey, and they bought the land on the western side then of the, uh, of the Baltimore Pike. And what was that uh, before before it became the cemetery, was it just farmland or? It's farmland. I believe it was a cornfield, part of an orchard. Okay. Um, 
And, of course, keep in mind, it's part of the battlefield. Well, yeah, there yeah. are artillery positions on the top of the hill that are is now, of course, today the cemetery. Right. Okay. All right. So now we'll move on here to uh, the great Trinetti. He's back from a short hiatus from the show, and he wants to know how many batteries were positioned on Cemetery Hill, and how does the creation of the Soldier Cemetery uh, affect, or how has the creation of the Soldier Cemetery affected the memorialization of those batteries? Okay, um, let's see. Let's count the batteries. One in New Hampshire. I, I think it would depend upon what time in the battle we're talking about, because right. at different points, units were moved in and out. But let's say we have Hall's battery, Huntington's battery, Edgell's yep. battery. Uh, I'm forgetting one up there, the U.S. regular one yep. near the fence. Um, Taft's battery, part of Taft's battery, New York artillery was in Evergreen Cemetery and mm -hmm. part of it was in uh, what is now the National Cemetery. I think the bigger question he might be asking here, uh, Roy, and um, I don't know how much thought I put into this, the National Cemetery is landscaped at such an early date, we don't really know exactly what it looked like between the time of the battle and the uh, landscaping of the cemetery itself. Do you believe, I guess I'm going to ask this question for him, do you believe there were lunettes in the cemetery just as there are on East Cemetery Hill today? I think there probably was. And those lunettes were probably destroyed when he built the cemetery. You know, one of the, uh, to get to the gist of the answer to his question is that, um, you know, and we mentioned McConaughey and Wills, there are two competing views for how the battlefield should be preserved. Uh, the National Cemetery is a beautiful place where there are trees and roadways and uh, we cut the grass nice and neatly and uh, that might be Will's um, interpretation of how the battlefield park should be uh, as it comes to as it comes to be. They don't have this right away. And then, of course, we have East Cemetery Hill, which has the original lunettes from the battle and the stone walls that were here during the fighting. And it's kind of preserved the way it was at the time of the battle. So in the haste to beautify Cemetery Hill and eventually plant trees on it, you know, it's kind of destroyed the reason that Cemetery Hill was important during the battle because it was a big open hill that dominated all the land around it. So the preservation of the cemetery and the establishment of the cemetery itself was a problem with, you know, trying to keep the battlefield looking the way it did at the time of the battle. Yeah. The and not every battery that was there has a, uh, a set of cannons near them either, right? That's true. Like Dilger's battery, their cannons are out there on the first day on Howard, but they were also here on the, on the, uh, the, the rest of the battle. And I yes. think they might have a flank marker or something here, but I don't think there's guns for marking Dilger. Yeah, I think there are. I think oh, there are? Yeah, they're, they're the there. two yeah. right, right over there, aren't they? Yes. And there's a little monument well, that's in the shape of a cannon, right? Yeah. Isn't that that? That's, that's Taft. Oh, that's yeah. Taft. That's not Dilger, okay. Oh, excuse All right. me. Well, thank you. I'm glad you guys are here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so Darth Etzkorn wants to know, in the annex of the National Cemetery, there is a line of evergreen trees along the fence by the coffee shop. Okay. Uh, is there any shred of truth to the rumor that under the tree in the corner closest to Steinware is a mass Confederate grave? I have honestly, in all the 52 years... I've never heard that. That sounds like something you would hear on a yeah, ghost tour. Obviously, that's a ghost tour. Ah. And the reason <laughs> that they tell stories like that is because the ghost tours are not allowed to walk into the cemetery onto park property. So they need to move yeah. stories closer to places like the parking lot of the coffee shop. Yeah. You know, I actually uh, I had family come and visit. My cousin brought her kids, and her one son was really into the ghost stuff, and they wanted to do a ghost tour. And I said, all right, have fun. I'll see you afterwards. And they said, no, 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 you got to come with us. So I went along, and um, we were... <laughs> We went to, I won't give too many details because I don't want to bash the company, but we went to this one area near Tommy's Pizza, and um, the person claimed that 
the reason that particular area was very haunted was because there was a mass Confederate grave there. And so as we were walking to the next stop, I went on my phone and I pulled up the Elliott map. <laughs> and I showed her son. I said, look, this is where we just were. Do you see any graves? And she, she my cousin yelled at me for ruining his... his, uh, <laughs> his I said, I'm trying to teach the kid history and you're yelling at me? But, you know, this is the world we live in. Um, but okay, so that sounds like a ghost tour story is the yeah. consensus here. And that's terrible. Okay. Joe Denise asks... How much of the story is true about the reveling in town the night before the dedication ceremony in November 1863? I would say there was quite a bit. Um, the town was packed. Uh, Were people camping out use, here? Huh? What? Weren't people camping out here or something? Like people, people camped all over the place? In the churches, sleeping in pews. <laughs> uh, Can you imagine? Um, how many bars is in the town of Gettysburg? Well, I mean, depending on how you count taverns, hotels, there's like eight or nine. But, you know, many, all the public buildings apparently had people sleeping in them. All the churches were open and people sleeping in the pews. Here, keep this in mind. It's almost like, you know, the battle. We have, according to the low figure, there are 10 or 15,000 people in town for the address. And the high figure reaches, you know, I think the Chicago Tribune says there's 50,000. I don't see it being that many. But there are not enough places for people to sleep. And so a lot of people just decide, since there's no place to sleep, just to stay awake all night. And uh, there's lots, you know, even according to some of the dignitaries that are at the ceremony, there's a lot of... Um, uh, parties that are available to attend that night. You, there's a lot of uh, carousing. Interesting. Yeah, because Lincoln's two private secretaries, Nicolay and Hay, they stayed up most of the night going from tavern to tavern to tavern. Oh, really? And from party to party to public speaking. So the town was, um, it was jumping. Did I read somewhere that uh, they the everybody was awakened uh, by... Uh, uh, cannon fire in the morning from right here? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. From here on top of Cemetery Hill, there's um, at least a battery of guns that are going to fire a salute in the a morning. A salute, right. And so that wakes up the whole town, and then the ceremonies for the day begin. What what time did uh, the Gettysburg Address occur? Was that. <laughs> That's a hard question to come by, too. Uh, well, first roughly. of all, the parade, which I. I think we're supposed to start around 10 in the morning. It's late getting started. And so the estimation is that Lincoln probably delivered the Gettysburg Address sometime in the early afternoon. I've heard people say 2 o'clock, maybe before that. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly the time. Okay. Yeah, that would have to depend on how long uh, Edward Everett spoke and what time they reached the cemetery and how True. long the prayer that thought itself a speech took place and things like that. Remember, you know, there's Boy, all kinds of things. Are you knocking Reverend Stockton, <laughs> chaplain of the Senate, who gave a oration, a, a prayer that was almost longer than, well, definitely it was longer than the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> yeah. Not longer than ever, thankfully. Yeah. He, this, J Tim Smith's picking on us ministers, and I'm a minister, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. I agree with you, Tim. No prayers should be long drawn out. They should not be. <laughs> but his was. Uh, Brian Derenick emailed us and said, Hi, Matt. I have a question for your Ask a Guide National Cemetery episode. One, can you speak to how the nine Confederate soldiers were accidentally buried in the National Cemetery and ended up in the individual state burial sections their remains are located in today. How were these soldiers later identified as the mistaken? Okay, well, I guess you're looking at the guy who found not all of them, but most of them. Uh, well, look at this. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start with the first one that I discovered. So when I started researching the cemetery, uh, what I did, I took all the names of all the people we have in the cemetery, those that are known, and I checked them with regimental rosters. Okay. So name after name after name, I would make sure, okay, the name is connected to this regiment and that regiment. Uh, I got to one man uh, by the name of E.T. Green, and he's buried in the Pennsylvania section, um, I believe 14th Pennsylvania Regiment, it says on the stone. 
is a problem right away. There's no 14th Pennsylvania Regiment on the battlefield. Okay. So I thought, okay, they must have made a mistake. Must be the 14th Brooklyn. So I looked at the 14th Brooklyn's roster. No E.T. Green. Hmm. Went through all the Pennsylvania listing. Nobody by that name even listed in Pennsylvania. So by chance, I just randomly said, oh, well, let's try Virginia. Let's try 14th Virginia. Boom. His name <laughs> appeared in the roster. Eli T. Green from Mecklenburg, Virginia. He's uh -huh. Armistead's brigade. Okay. So he's the first one that I discovered. Now, Kathy George Harrison, who used to be chief historian, she had already discovered John uh, Johnston, and he's buried in the uh, Mississippi plot. I mean, the Massachusetts okay. plot, but he is from Mississippi. Okay. So the nine Confederates that we have, I hate to use this word, unearthed, uh, oh, no, oh, I like okay. it. Right. Uh, the nine Confederates that we've discovered, every one of them, probably they got buried there because of the similarity of the abbreviations of the states that they came from and the similarity of the abbreviation of the state that they're buried in right now. Uh, E.T. Green is from Virginia. What's the abbreviation VA. for Virginia? VA. VA. And he's buried in the Pennsylvania plot. P.A. We have two Georgia boys buried also in the Pennsylvania plot. G.A. P.A. Okay. Uh, we have a Marylander, Southerner, buried in the Maryland plot. Oh, that's easy. Mm -hmm. Maryland and Maryland. And he was hit over in Corpse Hill uh, fighting against Maryland troops. We have two Carolina boys. Uh, Sidney Carter, who we know quite a bit about, Lieutenant Sidney Carter, he's in the 13th South Carolina. And David Williams, who's buried in also in the Connecticut plot, he's in the um, 14th North Carolina, I believe. No, 20th North Carolina. Uh, again, they're from Carolina, and they're buried in the Connecticut plot. So you got C and C. Okay. And then you have two Mississippi boys, uh, Johnson and... This one guy, B.N. Hyman. They're both from Mississippi, and they're buried in the Massachusetts plot. And for all these years, I've been trying to find out what the first name of B.N. Hyman was. And actually, just a few months, I found out. Napoleon Bonaparte Hyman. Bonaparte, wait, is it B.N. or N.B.? No, it's it's. Yeah, it's NB, sorry. NB, oh, okay. Hey, I'm old. I get things switched around, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, so his first name is Napoleon, middle name is Bonaparte, and Hyman. But again, Mississippi, buried in the Massachusetts plot. So those are the eight. Ah, uh, wait, but there's wait, a there's ninth nine. one. Yeah. And that's uh, James Ackers. He's also Mississippi, but he's buried in the Pennsylvania plot. And he's the only one that I really can't explain. Huh. The other ones are easy, the abbreviations, but uh, why James Acker is buried there, don't know. What regiment was Acker's? Um, Second Mississippi, Davis's Brigade. And just as a uh, aside here for the people who may not understand, after the Battle of Gettysburg, people were buried on the field, even Confederates buried by their comrades. And, you know, there were wooden headboards yeah. and the names were written in with pencil. Right. We can see this specifically in one of the photographs that was taken near the Rose Farm that shows dead um, in their graves, not covered with headboards. And if you go to the Library of Congress and download one of them, you can actually read the pencil written on uh, the um, headboard. So we're talking about months after the battle, someone trying to read the pencil inscription on a headboard, and they made a few mistakes. And that mistake just doesn't just end with Confederates being buried in the cemetery, uh, there are many people whose names are totally wrong or misspelled, and there are many people that are given the wrong regiments in the cemetery. Mm. And sometimes you will see on the stones, correct, gentlemen, it's been crossed out. It's been scraped out. And sometimes yes. another name like Darius or Darius Coyle. Um, right. Uh, right. You got some stories about that kind of stuff. Well, let me finish up. A couple of the men, a couple of the Confederates, like um, E.T. Green from Virginia, Armistice Brigade, and Hyman, 
they were wounded, brought into the Union lines, and they were taken to Camp Letterman. Those two men died at Camp Letterman. They were buried in Camp Letterman's um, cemetery. And again, as Tim said, yeah, the headboard is written probably in pencil, E.T. Green, 14th VA, but after months and months, you can't read it. And so, right. Oh, you can make you out an A. Right. And so you figure it's P.A. Right. Yeah. Correct. Uh, that's but they the, are, uh, as Tim also said, there. there's so many mistakes in the cemetery. Uh, there are three, let's see, I forgot, I just forgot the name of the guy, but the Michigan plot is horrible. Really? Uh, there's so many, uh, the duplicates of names, so many men's names are on the Michigan stones that didn't die, died years later. Huh. Uh, so we, so do we, do we know, or I guess we can't be confident that anywhere we see a name that the guy with that name is right under that stone? Uh, with most of them, I think you can be very confident, but you, yeah. you've got to check and check and check and do the research and find out. But, right. Yeah. Who was the guy from, I think it was the 90th Pennsylvania. Yeah, you're talking about Stephen Kelly. That's... Yeah, 91st, 91st Pennsylvania, yes. Little Round Top. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Stephen Kelly, uh, you talk about a guy that was organized. He had every part of his uniform stenciled with his name. His canteen, his knapsack, and his shirts. Smart. Uh, yeah, but on the march to Gettysburg, he got sick, and he was taken to Baltimore to a hospital. And we don't know that if his, if his knapsack and canteen were stolen from him, oh. or one of his comrades just took him the safeguard. Uh, I actually had an account down in the archives that Stephen Kelly said they were stolen from him. So, some soldier, we don't know who he was, probably of the 91st Pennsylvania, would be killed there on a little round top in that area. And because he supposedly had a canteen or the knapsack with Stephen Kelly's name stenciled on it, he is buried in the Pennsylvania sec uh, section under the name Stephen Kelly. Oh, wow. And... Tim, what was the first GAR encampment here? Guess well, um, what year was that? So, I, I, I have another source for you that I can give you. Exact, I know exactly what you're going to ask. Um, now we have this ability to go on uh, newspapers.com, and I Googled Stephen Kelly's name, and there's an article in 1883 during the dedication of the 91st Pennsylvania Monument, Stephen Kelly comes to Gettysburg. And he and his comrades are laying flowers on the soldiers in the 91st in the National Cemetery. And one of his comrades calls him over and says, hey, you got to see this. Oh, and so apparently, according to this, it was in July of 1883 when when he realized his name was there, according to this article. Yep. Yeah, I've read that article, too. Excellent. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, he sees his own name on this tombstone. And for years after that, he kept trying to convince the cemetery association here and the federal government because he wanted to get a pension that he wasn't dead yeah but they wouldn't believe him <laughs> um, and so for year after year he would come to gettysburg he would lay flowers on his grave as he said <laughs> and he also asked that when he did die he wanted to be buried in his grave here at gettysburg <laughs> but they wouldn't let him uh, so yeah stephen kelly is an interesting guy he's from philadelphia he died um Boy, I don't have the date he died. It, think 1890s or late 1880s. Uh, died in Philadelphia. By that time, he was quote quote a hermit. Ah. His house was falling down. He was a, uh, I guess, what do we call those people today? A, a, hoard a hoarder. A hoarder. Yeah. yeah. That's basically what he was. That's. Uh, can you imagine seeing yeah. your your own grave? That's yeah. very He's buried back today to the in the yeah. three. Philadelphia yeah. National yeah. Cemetery. One more thing before we leave this Southerners in sure, the Bobby. National Cemetery. Uh, late 1990s, I, I was guiding. You guys were all guiding. 96 or 97, I can't remember when all the excitement about the railroad cut find. Oh, yeah. Right? And that body was buried in our cemetery. A 1996 was, was when it, they found the body. Okay, yeah. Was that a Confederate? <laughs> they found... A cuff button, 
and part of a shoe. Yeah, I read the archaeology report not too long ago, and because I have everybody asked this question, did they ever identify the Confederate or is he a Southerner? And what the what the archaeological report stated was that there was a part of a shoe that looked like it was the type of shoe manufactured by a North Carolina company during the Civil War. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about other conjectural evidence? Such there was as, a bullet near the body. Okay. But the archaeologists couldn't say whether that bullet had fallen out of the body that deteriorated or that bullet happened to be laying in the ground below the body. Correct. But wasn't right. th did the report say that this was clearly a Civil War soldier? No. It could be a hobo in the 1870s that got hit by the train. Oh, I was under the impression that they had established that it was a Civil War it, it, it soldier. It was very, you know, we had all kinds of people that, that, that said, oh, it must be this or it must be that. Uh, okay. Or, but in the end, when you read the archaeological report, which you can buy, um, it was printed in a booklet. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but they used to sell it at the uh, bookstore. So you can find it on the Internet, I'm sure. Um, and uh, the, it, it was very inconclusive. Okay. Uh, if it was a soldier from the Battle of Gettysburg, would it make sense that it would be a Confederate? They buried their own dead. They didn't leave a record of where. And that's why it took so long to unsurface. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Where exactly was it found? Was it in the like in the wall of the it cut? It was found or? on the wall of the cut, about uh, I, if I remember correctly, like twenty feet from the right flank marker of the Six Wisconsin. Yeah, wasn't that's it my the, memory. Or then Ninety Fifth New York, right? Yeah, Ninety Fifth New York. But right it was flank. on the south side of the York. railroad. Okay. Yeah. On the south side of the railroad. Which cut. at that point the wall is pretty low. It is pretty low. Yeah. So okay. Interesting. Um, I, I see. I, I, I'm oh. surprised to find out that that we're not completely certain that was a soldier. But you know, I'm gonna say that you know, it's probably a Southern Civil War soldier. If Bob's point is that they purposely buried a Southerner in the National Cemetery when they specifically weren't burying Southern soldiers mm. in it, I I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let me, um, Roy, let me hit you with something that I think is fascinating, and that's that. Okay. So we have the story, for instance, about Stephen Kelly. And then later, they scratch Stephen Kelly's name out and they recarve in the scratch out, unknown. Now, we know where he's buried because the cemetery published a list of every person buried in the cemetery of the names on every stone in like 1865 and that's been printed and so you can walk around with this booklet that was printed in the 1860s it's been reprinted several times and you can actually go from grave to grave to grave and see what the graves used to say and so we can go to pennsylvania row a grave 12 off the top of my head <laughs> and you can see Stephen <laughs> Kelly, Company E, 91st Pennsylvania, in that book. Um, is that right? I don't even know what row it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's, row, row. it's row A, but it's farther down. <laughs> right. But. So are there only men, males, buried oh. in the National Cemetery? No. Oh. There scandalous. Are, there are four women buried in the Pennsylvania plot. Row G. They are wives of Civil War veterans, and their husbands died years after the Civil War. Because, okay, if you're a veteran of the Civil War, you can be buried in the National Cemetery. doesn't yeah. matter if you fought at Gettysburg or not. So these four men, uh, when they passed away, they were veterans of the war. They were buried in the Pennsylvania section, and their wives are buried with them. So there's four of them. So when people— On top of each other? Probably not, because if you look at row G, there's a lot of gaps, a lot of gaps, a lot of gaps. They're not just one right after another. Huh. Okay. I don't think the wives are buried on top of the husbands. Oh, okay. That's just not right. All right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, we have a lady here with our group, and she is agreeing with me 100%. <laughs> yeah. if, if you are at the National Cemetery in the semicircle part, and you're looking at a particular name, Okay, are, are you actually standing above the person that was buried there? And is their head pointing to the Soldiers National Monument, the Genius of Liberty, or are their feet pointed that way? Their head is pointing to the National Soldiers Monument. 
So if they would sit up that resurrection day, <laughs> they're looking out over the battlefield. Ah, but that so was not it intentional. Is, so it is a headstone. Okay. So you're standing, you're looking at down at the name, the person's right in front of you, the head is there at the stone. Oh, so so where you're standing is not where the person on the stone, where the, where the name is. Like So in other words, uh, Tom Smith, I'm looking at Tom Smith, he's not below my feet, he's on the other side of the stone. Correct. Okay. And you know what's really interesting about that, Roy? Um, uh, that's true. They're on the outside, in other words, of the Soldier's National Monument from where the inscription of their name is. And when the Park Service cut the, well, they put the road, I shouldn't say the Park Service, when the War Department cut the road through the cemetery in the last row, especially in the New York section, they cut really close to the graves. And then they kind of contoured the ground off. And I always wonder in some of these graves if they cut into the grave a little bit, depending on how deep the, the, the coffin is or yeah. the grave. Now, now when I mention this, because um, in the early days of guiding, and I should say, Roy, that I did not start guiding until the cemetery is off limits to cars and buses. But as a tourist, I came here often and buses would pull into the National Cemetery and the buses would pull off the road and pull right onto the graves, right on top of the graves. And I remember one time I was walking through the cemetery and a um, maintenance man was driving a stake into a grave on the side of the road that said no parking on grass. And I was like, and I'd been on Roy's tours, so I was familiar with the way the soldiers were buried. And I was like, man, you know, you're driving that that post right through somebody's body. <laughs> and I don't think people realize, yeah. realized this, what Roy's saying. They didn't realize this. And that's the reason the road's so close to the edge of the graves. That's crazy. How deep were the bodies? Uh, three feet down. Now, they have added topsoil to, the, to it. Uh, the stones originally were 18 inches higher uh, above the ground. So the guy is buried three feet down. That's the bottom of the casket. But the headstone will be 18 inches higher. But now all the topsoil has been put in so you can mow all the stones, therefore, are flush with the ground. So you got, yeah, three feet, 18 inches. So the stones weren't originally flat like they are today? No. Well, they were not flush well, with the flush, ground. Yeah, yeah, still yeah. flat, but they had to be flush. Right, okay. Huh, that is uh, some pretty fascinating before stuff. We, uh, before we go on, those 979 stones, are they really unknown? Not all of them. Uh, through my research, I've been able to identify at least six of those unknown soldiers. And the reason why... Uh, when Samuel Weaver, who was in charge of the disinterment of the bodies, he kept very detailed ledger of every single body he disinterred. He made sure that every body that was dug up, he was there. And he would rummage through the pockets of the soldier and try to identify who he was with a letter or stencil with a, with a shirt or something. He had long probes that he could go into the pockets. So Samuel Weaver kept, kept a detailed account of every single soldier and what was on the soldier's body. Now, where was I going with that? Unidentified that have names. Oh, yes, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what he also did, all the soldiers had to be buried in the state plots. Well, there was a few soldiers that he knew their name, what was written on the headboard, but he didn't know what state they were from. So he couldn't bury them in a state plot because he doesn't know what state, but he does still know the person's name. So in his ledger, he would write down the person's name, but give it a number as an unknown soldier, but even though he still knew who it was. So you take that, and yes, you take his numbers, and you can go over there to those stones and say, okay, grave 255. And is this a real example? Is John Morrison. Okay. Yeah, from Massachusetts. Uh, so what I did again, I took those numbers, took those names, went over and tried to identify who they were. There's one of the unknown soldiers, though, that I had a mess with. Because in Weaver's notation, it said Isaac Cavery. 
I couldn't find anybody by the last name of Cavalry. <laughs> he was in the cavalry? Yeah, and then all of a sudden the light bulb came on in my head. Uh, oh, doggone it. He's a, he's a cavalryman. That's uh, it. So I looked through the cavalry. There's only one Isaac that was killed in the battle who was in the cavalry, and that was Isaac Vivet. Interesting. So, but yeah, there's about six of the unknowns. So even back then, people there. couldn't spell cavalry. Right. And okay. Back I thought to that was just a new cavalry. Thing. I mean, cavalry. <laughs> cavalry. And since there's not many killed cavalrymen in the battle, <laughs> it's easy have. to find. <laughs> you never see those dead cavalrymen. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. I just wanted Here, some of that let, background well, information. Let out me there, tell which a I find story that uh, Roy probably uh, is. You know, from my point of view, Roy and I had been. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to the National Archives with him in the early '90s a few times when he was working on his cemetery book. And he had this dream. And it was that Samuel Weaver stated that each one of these soldiers with the numbers, that he saved the stuff he found on the body. Like there would be a photograph of a little girl or a photograph of a wife, and he would put it in a box. And apparently these boxes for the 979 unknown were kept at the cemetery gatehouse or something like that. So when people came, they could rummage through and try to identify people. And Roy believed that those boxes with those items still exist and was trying to find them. <laughs> <laughs> is that crazy or is that a... <laughs> no, and I know exactly where all those boxes. I think there was 80-some 80, 80 boxes that Weaver packed up of combs, toothbrushes, uh, coins, muddy, letters, photographs, all kinds of stuff. I think there's 80-some boxes that he had. Oh, I know exactly where they are. Where? Remember the movie... Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> and the last scene, yeah. you have them pushing the box with the Ark through this <laughs> warehouse. With a, that's where they are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, we have no idea where those boxes are. <clears throat> uh, they have just vanished. vanished. And yeah, Kathy George Harrison again. She spent so much time down in Washington trying to find out where those articles went. Never found out. Huh. So they were either stolen. Or, yep, well, in a warehouse somewhere. So here's a question that I uh, hear people ask a lot. And um, why are some soldiers unknown? What were the reasons that they would go in the unknown plot or, or section? Um, now, you just gave us one, but what were some other reasons? I mean, they, I, the answer I usually give is pretty basic, you know, decay and stuff like that. But you... I would go Am along right? with that, you know, bodies laid out in the field for days, uh, especially the first day dead, and you just, you know, he doesn't have any identification on his body. You know, they might know he's a New Yorker because of the buttons or his uniform. Here, I have a specific, uh, easy answer that I've found, and, uh, you know, going through the list of the people who are buried in the cemetery and looking at the known people... Um, it appears as if, if you were killed in action, you're probably in an unknown grave. If you were wounded and die a few days later, oh. you can, somebody will write your name down. And the majority of the people who are known are the ones that died in hospitals after the battle. And the majority of the unknown, I suspect, because we don't have the unknown state of death, are men who were killed in battle. That's my okay. take on it. Oh, that's a good one. All right. All right, let's, uh, let's move on here. Steve from Delaware says, In a strange and blighted land, Coco mentions that Wills had a collection of nearly 300 packages of valuables and personal items. Oh, we just did this, didn't we? <laughs> oh, that's all right. You answered that. Well, that was Steve from Delaware who asked that question, and it was Thank answered you, already. Um, all right, civil underscore war underscore nerd asks, What is the name of the poem on the plaques around the cemetery? Bivouac of the Dead. Yeah, the poem is the Bivouac of the Dead, written by Timothy O'Hara. And he wrote it um, at the time of the Mexican War in uh, commemoration of American dead in the Battle of... Vista. Vista? Okay. My Spanish is not good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a long, long poem. And in most national cemeteries, you will see stanzas of that poem, yeah. Bivouac of the Dead. Yeah. Uh, all right. 
Oh, you know, I should mention it. Uh, we all have things that happen to us on tours that are totally unexpected that just, you know, blow our minds. But uh, one day I was telling the story of the bivouac of the dead while I was standing in front of one of the plaques on the battlefield. And I had on my tour the uh, high school band. And after I got done telling the story, this kid raised his hand and said, Mr. Smith, do you know if you sing the bivouac of the dead to the theme of Gilligan's Island, it has the same cadence? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Do you want to try it? <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Roy's got it. Roy's Here got it. it. I think I know out. one of them. A three-hour <laughs> poem. <laughs> Do the on fame's immortal camping grounds. Oh, God, it works. There are silent tents are spread. Okay, we'll have to do this together, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> it's a solo, it? Roy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's the, first, that's the first verse, and that's the only reason I know it. Wait a minute. I have to do this as a duet. Okay. This is, wait, we're not very good singers. No, we're not. Okay. okay. On fame's Famous eternal camping, camping ground, their silent tents are spread, and glory guards with solemn round. Oh, you have to, you have to drag oh, that man, out. Oh, man, it works. Oh, well, <laughs> the bivouac of the dead. <laughs> it does work. That's awesome. And I'm yeah, sure it works yeah. for a lot of other uh, poems and songs, too. But that's the kind of thing you get from eighth graders who are not really paying attention not, to your tour. I don't want to edit it out for the, for the sake of the beautiful voices of Tim. <laughs> it's just the lasting memory now. I have to uh, suffer every time. <laughs> just yesterday, I was walking with a friend. We were looking at the bivouac of the dead and looking at Stephen Kelly's grave and... Oh, my. <laughs> now I can't get that out of now, my mind. Now, a high school kid brought that to your attention? So was he just like, did he have the Gilligan's Island theme song in his head as you're, like, walking around and he's noticing it? Like, how did he, do you know? Yeah, doesn't everybody have the theme song of Gilligan's <laughs> Island in your head playing continuously? Because they, they I do. do. On a lot of our Getty's Bike tours, which last three oh, hours, three I hours. often have people yeah. sing that. It's a three-hour three hour tour. tour. Yeah, good point. All right. <laughs> They can't lock us up forever. And when they set us free, Getty's Bike Tours wants you to know that we've been social distancing since before that was even a term. Now the best way to see the battlefield just got better. When you take a tour with Getty's Bike Tours, you don't have to set foot into any enclosed space. It's all outdoors. Keeping a distance between you and others in your group has always been a matter of bicycle safety. So the more social distance between you and the other riders, the better. While you're welcome to bring your own bike and helmet, Getty's Bike assures you that all of our helmets and bikes are sanitized after each use like they have been for years. Heck, we'll even have hand sanitizer for you as well as sanitize the pens at the check-in counter. So if you still want to tour Gettysburg after the economy reopens but don't want to be confined to an enclosed space while doing it, then give Getty's Bike Tours a call at 717-752-7752 or book online at gettysbike.com. Oh, and forgive us if we don't shake hands. While our doors are still closed to the public due to the shutdown, Victorian Photography Studio is still doing business online. We offer gift certificates, t-shirts, and prints on our website, victorianphotographystudio.com. We are also taking commissions to shoot monuments, landscapes, and architecture out on the battlefield or anywhere reasonably local. Got a favorite photo of yourself, a pet, or your kids? Well, we could take digital photos and turn them into tintypes right in our studio. So email us at vpsgettysburg at gmail.com for prices and details, or go to victorianphotographystudio.com. And don't forget to let them know that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Oh, my favorite place to go. Mason Dixon Distillery. They create their award-winning spirits from grain grown on Gettysburg National Military Park. And they cook their comfort food from ingredients sourced from local farms. For great food, amazing drinks, engaging conversation, and plenty of on-site parking, which is really hard to find here in Gettysburg, head over to Mason Dixon Distillery located at 331 East Water Street. Mention you heard this ad on Addressing Gettysburg and get a free dessert with any meal. That's right. I said free just because you mentioned this show. That's Mason Dixon Distillery, 331 East Water Street, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Okay, I know spots like these are annoying, but they're a necessary evil when it comes to free content, so here we go. There are three ways to support this show and the Addressing Gettysburg project as a whole. 
One, the most effective way, is becoming a monthly subscriber at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash addressing Gettysburg. Our patrons receive access to interviews with experts recorded especially for them. Number two, the fun way by getting some merch over at our store at addressinggettysburg.com. Show that you are in the know by wearing one of our t-shirts, hoodies, or other items at addressinggettysburg.com. And number three, the freeway. You shop at Amazon like everyone else, so why not make those unnecessary sales that only make you feel guilty anyway count for something? Every time you want to go and shop on Amazon, go to addressinggettysburg.com first, then click that Amazon banner at the top of the homepage and sign in and shop like you normally would. The beauty of this is that Amazon gives us credit for qualifying sales while it doesn't cost you one cent more than you intended to spend in the first place. But you gotta make sure that you do it every time you shop Amazon. Okay there, we're finished with the obligatory pitch for your support. Man, our Patreon patrons must be laughing right now saying, we don't have to sit through commercials on Patreon. Wink. Uh, okay. Finally, we'll, uh, we'll close with these three questions from the hiking historian. She wants to know, the first question she's got is, what methods were used to try and identify the soldiers? Second one is, were any identified soldiers removed from the cemetery by their family to be reinterred in their hometown? And finally, do we know what unit has the most soldiers buried in the cemetery that could be identified? What was the first so one? the first one, what methods were used to try to identify the soldiers? We kind of covered this a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah Samuel Weaver would uh, look for letters, diaries, Bibles, stencils. Photographs. Photographs, anything on the body that could. But keep in mind, a lot of them, again, had the wooden headboards. The wooden, yeah. That were... Were there already. were no military issue ID dog tags like we would have later in wars, but there yeah. were some men I think who did purposely purchase things like that to yes. to right. help identify just in case. Did they also flatten a bullet and scratch their initials or name into it too? I thought I saw a picture of. Uh, Don't know about that. My great grandfather's musket, which I have on my mantle, has his initials in it uh -huh. and his regiment number. Right. Um, so I know at least in that one case they did that. I have a, a breastplate, and the guy scratched his name and division in the back of that. Okay. But I and don't know. how there, there probably had to be like 200 men with the last name of Martin in the 3rd right. Division. And sometimes I think men would of. write their names uh, on pieces of paper, wouldn't they? And, and Pin put it them, to their, fix them to their yeah. uniform. All right. So then the second one is... Uh, were any identified soldiers removed uh, by their families and reinterred in their hometowns? Correct. Um, in fact, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Uh, Major Noah Ferry, who's in the 5th Michigan Cavalry, he was initially buried in the uh, Michigan plot, uh, row I. His body was removed, taken to his home. So, it's, yeah, there's quite a few of them. Uh, Lieutenant Wesley Miller who's a U.S. regular, 7th U.S. Infantry. His body was taken up to Harrisburg. So, yeah, there's quite a few of them that years later or months later, their bodies were disinterred and, the bo and families and, claimed them. And then again, there's also a large number, I don't think anyone could know, of mm. men who died at this battle who would have been buried somewhere but not in the National Cemetery necessarily, mm. whose families, especially if they were local, they would make the trip here and they'd, Get they'd the body and they take them, yeah. them back home to bury them. Now, and th this is something I meant to ask you before. So, um, people that go to the National Cemetery and look at the, the half circle section and assume that those are all Gettysburg dead, we've established, are incorrect. There's Civil War dead, mostly Gettysburg dead. Mostly. Mostly, but not all. Let's, right. let's throw a number out there. How many Civil War burials are there in this National Cemetery? 3,500? Yeah. Yeah, I used to 3, say 3,555. Okay. was the initial number okay. uh, of Gettysburg dead. Okay. But, of course, then there's more added to it. So should we mention the you just said 3,000? 
Five hundred twelve. I, I don't want to hold anyone to it. I, no, no. in my mind, and and Roy is like the gospel to me when it comes to this because I, I I you know read his book. Um, in my mind, it stuck with three thousand five hundred fifty five Civil War burial, but it's in the right ballpark. You were saying about this. It probably depends like? on how you qualify the question. Like how many people are buried in the inner circle? How many people buried in inner circle are Civil War dead? You know things like yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. Guys, I can help you with this here. A little book uh, by a guy named uh, Charles Teague. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, there's uh, a man named Timothy H. Smith who's acknowledged in the back of this book, too. <laughs> um, but burials in the National Cemetery, 3,512 Union dead initially buried, nine misidentified Confederates, 979 unidentified dead, 3,706 total Civil War dead, 7,000 total internments, or internments, excuse me, uh, 3,320 Confederate dead exhumed from field graves in early 1870s, 2,935 taken to Hollywood Cemetery, Richmond. Very good. Before we leave, um, a couple more things, if it's okay, that just like to hear from Roy and from Tim. Of course, Bob. Uh, and I don't think we've really talked about it yet. The, the Southern dead, how long are they staying here? Um, are there any still out there? And then if we could, a little bit about the Evergreen Cemetery, because if I'm not mistaken, there's, what, well, 91 wait. or so buried there as yeah. well. Yeah, we, before we get to that, okay. though, we have the third question, though. Oh, that, sorry. Uh, that's okay, the hiking historian. It's, uh, do we know what unit has the most soldiers buried oh, in the yeah, cemetery? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let me take a poll here, because I tabulated them up the other night, so I know the number. Okay. So can I guess? So, go I ahead, think I know. Tim, guess. First Minnesota. I was going to take that one, <laughs> stinker. <laughs> 52. So Tim Smith wants First There's Minnesota. There's 52 bodies there. And the, you want Minnesota First Minnesota, Park. too. Uh, okay, well, so I was going to say, if I could qualify it by percentage, I was going to say First Minnesota. So let's hit, some, but let's hit another state that has a lot of men killed that we suspect may be there, just so that we get another guess in, because he's going to tell us we're wrong. So uh, okay. 24th good. Michigan. Oh, oh that's 24th a good one. Michigan. Ah. Well, the 157th New York. Excellent. 157th ah, New York ah. has like a, a huge amount of dead in the first day. You know, it would all come down to how good your regimental burial crew was. Yeah, and maybe how far away your state is. Right, because Pennsylvania units, their their families will come and get them out of here. Mm. Well, guess what? <laughs> you guys are both right. First Minnesota. Uh, there's 34 identified uh, Minnesota men buried in the Minnesota plot. There's a lot of unknowns there also. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no first surprise. Minnesota regiment. When you lose that much of your unit, there's not a lot of guys left to, to tell people who that was. Right. How about the urn in the Minnesota plot? Uh, what's the uh, significance of that? Yeah, the urn, in fact, that is the oldest memorial on the battlefield other than a carving. A, a rock like in carving. the rocks, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, the first Minnesota urn was placed in 1867. Oh, real? Oh, that long ago? Okay. Oh, nice. When was the uh, cornerstone of the Soldiers National Monument laid? 1865. But just the cornerstone? Just the cornerstone. Right. Correct. And um, I know that, that, that it's not the same thing, but a lot of times people will ask, well, did Lincoln speak from that rostrum that you first see there? So what, what do you say about that? <laughs> no, because uh, the roster Steven wasn't Spielberg built did, until 1879, so Lincoln didn't speak from there, and he didn't speak at the National Soldiers' Monument either. Right. We do have a number of uh, presidents ha who have yep. spoken from that yeah. rostrum, though. Quite a few presidents Later. have spoken from the rostrum. <clears throat> Eisenhower, um, Theodore Roosevelt, um, Lyndon Johnson, I think when he was vice president. Uh, so quite a few. Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover. Uh, yeah. Roy, uh, where do we believe that Lincoln was when the Gettysburg Address was delivered? Oh, he's standing on the platform. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, oh, exactly. Oh, That's your answer, okay. folks. Yeah. So he's not the only one that can crack a joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, I started, when I started guiding uh, Dr. Frederick Tilburg, who was chief historian, insisted that the platform where Lincoln spoke was where the National Soldiers' Monument is located. And now through the research, myself and other individuals like um, Bill Frasinito and Kathy George Harrison, no, 
it was just on the other side of the iron fence, just inside the Evergreen Cemetery. In fact, the way the platform was aligned, it was actually not facing uh, where the Soldiers National Monument is today. That's where the flagpole was. And we had always thought the platform faced toward the flagpole. But if you look at one of the sketches that was made at the time, the platform is angled. And so actually part of the platform, which is 20 feet by 12 feet, probably stuck out through where the iron fence is today. Probably the left side of the platform was sticking out where diagonally where the uh, iron fence is today. And the right side was in the Evergreen Cemetery. So, so Roy, fa- just on facing, the other side. Facing what? Like facing south north east actually or? facing toward us. Yeah, facing, facing toward, toward us. Actually, yeah, facing northwest. Okay. So northwest. Th- northeast. Yes, northeast. <laughs> northeast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there a photograph taken from in there where we could see the gatehouse in the background? Is mm-hmm. that like is that how you figured it or there's several photographs that were taken um, that showed the gatehouse. Uh, there's a photograph taken from the gatehouse looking back to where the platform is. Oh. There's another photograph taken close down to where the Illinois and Delaware, West Virginia plots looking up toward the platform. So there's several different photographs, plus um, Joseph Becker's sketch that he made for Leslie's Illustrated Weekly that shows some of the headstones in the Evergreen Cemetery. So you line them all up. Right. And... Also go with all the newspaper accounts, and yeah, it's it's got to be just inside the Evergreen Cemetery. I don't know if it's still there, but on Steinware Avenue in front of the Quality Inn, I think there was a wayside marker that has that photograph of uh, with Lincoln as he's sitting down, you know, the blurry Lincoln, and uh, I believe I haven't looked at it in years, and I don't again, I don't know if it's still there, but I believe it said that. Um, it is believed that that photo was taken from roundabout where the the marker is on Steinware Avenue, but uh, that never made sense to me. Oh, oh I think uh, Roy, he's talking about. No, I, I think you're talking about uh, the. Fo- there was a photograph by a Hanover photographer. It's one of those weavers taken down near the Quality Inn on the Emmitsburg Road, looking across the Tawny Town Road to the. And that's the one that's down on Steinware Avenue. No, oh, it's not the one of Lincoln sitting. Oh, is no, it the it's one not with the, the little Lincoln. boy in the foreground? No, is no, that the no. One I'm this, is a, this is a much f- more, it's farther, much farther away looking up at uh, Cemetery okay, I gotta go look at it again. Sitting, isn't that the one on the wayside now? Yeah, in the they, they have that wayside in the in, cemetery. Yeah, in the yeah. cemetery. But this right. is on Steinware Avenue, yeah. the one I'm and talking about. And did they about. position that one in the cemetery, the wayside, so that you would be looking over towards where Lincoln was supposedly it's, standing? It's positioned incorrectly. Okay. So it should be angled even more towards the west then, I guess. Yes. Okay. Just Uh, inside the fence, huh? Yeah, you know, okay, the iron fence, which of course was not there at the time. Right. There's a gate. By the way, it's not there now either. Did you see that? I was walking through the cemetery yesterday and a large section of the Sickles fence is missing. They have barriers now. The park is, they're doing something. I don't know what. I was going to ask oh, you guys a story. You know what. I haven't been there. So when you, when, before you leave, just go over and take yeah, a look. I'll have to do that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, th- there's a gate, uh, the iron gate. And basically, the platform is literally just on the other side of that gate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the Sickles fence, and I was going to ask you about that. The story of that iron fence that separates the private from the National Cemetery. <laughs> Like, what, well, what, originally, why did he call it the Sickles Fence? Yeah, originally it was in Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. And supposedly, you know, it's the fence that beside where Daniel Sickles shot, murdered Philip Barton Key in the love affair um, in 1859 before the war. Okay. Oh, Roy, I'm not sure if you're aware of it because I, I noticed that you don't keep up on the ghost tour stories, the latest ghost tour stories. But uh, I heard a ghost tour guide standing near the Evergreen Cemetery because, you know, we don't want him coming in Evergreen Cemetery. But he was standing near the edge of the property, and he said that Sickles' ghost is often seen along the fence. <laughs> of course, oh, because this fence, fence was in Lafayette right Park. Uh, and he said if you walk up the fence a short distance, you'll see where a bullet has grazed part of the fence uh, with one of the shots that he missed key uh, with. 
That's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. what we ought to. We ought to all go on one of these tours. Oh, sometime. I know. I know. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> you ought to do a live. Oh, you ought to do, do a that. live performance. <laughs> and have a whole bunch of guides like. In that case, you got to give the ghost tour credit uh, for that. Is genius. Yeah, that to is suggest genius. that there's a bullet hole in the fence. Right? Yeah. Then you got a whole bunch of idiots running up there looking for bullet holes. And that's probably why the fence is missing. <laughs> People are taking it now. <laughs> it's corroded from all the oil uh, from our skin. I, I believe too. It was uh, sickles as. A a legislator who initiated the legislation to remove that fence in what the 1880s or something, 1888. I don't know when it was. R- remove it and have it put here. And put here. Yeah, yeah. Both between the cemetery and that's this a section of it around the copse of trees. Well, where was it originally? Lafayette Square or I Lafayette think, well, Park? Lafayette Park. Yeah, Gettysburg. Yeah. Oh yeah, but originally they did have the the fence came across the top of Cemetery Hill all the way down to the McKnight House and all the way along the avenue down there. You yeah. know, so it's pretty expansive. They had a much larger section of the fence wow. on the East Cemetery Hill side of the Baltimore Pike all the way down. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Good, yeah. good, good. And then so, in the huh. what it was the 1930s. They shifted it over to separate the Evergreen and the, and the National. Yeah, for a while, there was just a hedge between the Evergreen Cemetery and okay. the uh, right. uh, National Cemetery. Wow, Cemetery. that's yeah. cool. How about, uh, tell us about the Hancock Gate and why did it appear <laughs> a few years ago? Uh, well, Bob's referring to the fence on the other side of um, uh, the National Cemetery on the Tony Town Road side. And uh, just recently, they put back a fence uh, that actually uh, led to the original Hancock Avenue. That's why we call it Hancock, because it's Hancock Avenue. So prior to the cyclorama being built and prior to the road being um, extended down to the Emmitsburg Road to get onto uh uh, Hancock Avenue, going by the angle, you'd come up to Tony Town Road and across from the National Cemetery and slightly down the hill a little bit uh, south of it, you made a right onto Hancock Avenue to get into the battlefield. And this is where we're talking about the old Sacramento parking lot. And it was a gate you went through. And at first, you know, we're looking at the GBMA photographs. It's a wooden gate. And then they put in a more formal metal gate. And then I believe in the 1920s, it is, they put in this stone gate. And apparently, when the park had removed this gate at some point, I don't know when it was removed, the park had it in storage. And when they were uh, working on the Sekarama parking lot and the tearing down of the old visitor center and the restoration of Cemetery Hill, somebody pointed out that, hey, we still have all the parts left from this original gate not original, but one of the gates that led on the Hancock Avenue. So the park decided to put it back. Now, you know, it's been controversial over the years with uh, um, uh, different tour guides and historians because I thought we were trying to restore the battlefield to the way it appeared at the time of the battle. And what are we doing? Putting a, restoring a 1920s gate? I don't understand at all. But it was there. They had it and they put it back out. So that's why it's there. And oftentimes I see people trying to turn into it. Have you seen that? Not often. Okay, once yeah. or twice I've seen yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I mean, I, I guess it's a it was a, a function of we had all the pieces of it and it was in storage and they put it back out. So it was originally at the end of Hancock Avenue, which would have been yeah. the beginning, but, which would be the, the entrance to the Gettysburg National Military Park. Because originally the traffic. Because originally went you turned into that gate and then it went up and then around what is now the second parking line down Hancock Avenue and Ziggler's Grove. And yes. that was about when the 30s when it was that well, way? Well, in the 1880s, that was the entrance. And then, you know, they kept redoing the entrance. And like I said, that thing that they put up back up is not the original entrance gate. It's like the third. Right. The most, the last one? The, or, yeah. yeah. When Before very few they, veterans would have ever seen it. I mean, that's 1920s. That's so late. Yeah, if you know. wanted to restore this place the way of looked in the 1880s when a veteran would recognize it, that gate wouldn't have been recognized. Yeah, I don't even know when they when this gate. Would, I could be wrong, but today might be a little earlier. OK, I and, think it was 1926. OK. And um, I was, again, walking through right. yesterday and I, and I noticed they are replacing those cannonball piles. Uh, by, I guess it's Taft's battery and Dilger's battery there near the restrooms. There's two nice, shiny, black painted piles of cannonballs. Um, is that a decision that they're going to do that all over the battlefield now again? I don't think they're going to do it all over the battlefield because if they do that, they're going to run into the same problem why they took them off in the first place. Why did they take them off in the People first place? People were stealing them. Oh. 
that how are they that easy to steal? They're good not old bolted down. Uh, yeah. So there was a lot of a lot of them that were being hit and broken and being stolen. So the Park Service made a, you know, just a thought, take them all off. Uh, but now I think they're putting them around randomly. I don't I don't see every one of them being okay. put back again. So maybe the cemetery and it'd be nice if you could see one over by the angle, perhaps. Yeah, they've got the yeah, like uh, Cushing's battery. That would be cool there. if they completed yeah. the the look. Yeah. Um, How about the Southern Dead? Oh yeah, your question. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, the Confederate dead are basically left on the field in mass graves uh, for what about seven years, and then Rufus Weaver is going to be contacted by Southern Lady Societies that want their dead returned back home. So he will start an effort to disinter the Confederate dead and have them boxed up, because at that time they're all unknown. He, you know, I, I would say the boxes probably contained bones, rocks, dirt, and everything, mm. and shipped them to Macon, no wait, Manet, to Richmond, Virginia, and most of them are gonna be taken to Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, uh, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, and Raleigh, North Carolina. So those are the four places where most of the Confederate dead then are taken south, but that's years after the war. And do you ever have someone on a tour say, that's not right, why couldn't they bury the Southern dead here too? And uh, sure. I've actually never had anybody say that. Oh, I, I have. Yeah, I mean, people say that a lot, and you know, I, I think it is, it is, it is difficult to, to answer that question. I mean, I think the people that are the victims of this dispute as to whether they should remove the southern bodies or not are the local townspeople. I mean, for years and years after the battle, farmers have dead bodies all over their fields. And here's, here's something that's interesting. And, 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 and it, I, I'm definitely not a southerner. I definitely don't have like uh, Southern tendencies or Southern sympathies and people, I've actually been accused of being pretty harsh on the Southerners, <laughs> more harsh than I should be on my tours. I want to qualify that. But you know, <laughs> sure, it's a natural inclination to feel bad about what happened to the Southern dead after the battle after the battle was over. The townspeople would like the Southerners to remove from their fields. And here's something, and I say this, not trying to be anti-government, but the federal government stepped in after the battle and arrested townspeople for picking up stuff off of their personal property, like guns and swords and bullets and artillery shells. Apparently, the bullets that were fired by the soldiers and the guns that were left on the battlefield on your property are government property, not your property. And so these people are arrested for stealing government property by picking stuff off of their property that's dropped there. But you know what the federal government doesn't claim? They don't have any responsibility for the dead Confederate soldiers they killed and put on your property. <laughs> That's not their problem. Right. <laughs> Obviously, I'm just keep teasing a little bit, but right. it is a serious problem for the farmers, and they would like someone to come to Gettysburg and recover these dead so they can farm their fields again without, you know, having to plow up bodies. And let's talk about just the time from the battle until the Confederates are moved. Do you think the farmers did not plow their fields? Right. And then when mm. they did plow their fields, and then afterwards they come back to find the bodies, are the Southern organizations for recovering bodies going to find all the bodies after years of plowing? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I mean, Kathy George, uh, Roy mentioned Kathy George earlier, who was a park historian here for many, many years and did a lot of valuable work on different park projects. She was very controversial about this in some of the first meetings I ever attended at a guide. You know, usually people would downplay the idea that maybe Southern are still buried here. Well, maybe they missed a few or maybe there is a couple here and there, but they would make it sound like it was an isolated you know, um, uh, situation. She would come out in these park lectures and she would say, okay, this is the number of soldiers that were moved to cemeteries that we know of. This is the number of Confederate soldiers we think were killed during the battle. There's a difference of about a thousand. And those people, 
must, uh, many of them must still be buried on the battlefield. And she would present it as if there's hundreds, if not a thousand Southerners still buried on the battlefield. And I always appreciated that, that she did that. Maybe she was one extreme, that, maybe that's an extreme example, but I appreciated that she did that and that she was always trying to make a point that, hey, it's a lot more people still buried here on the battlefield and probably Union soldiers too than people are willing to talk about or think about. So what do you think? Do you think there there are still some soldiers? Because people ask this one sure. all the time, I too. Don't think, I don't think there is. I know that there's a lot of soldiers still yeah. buried here. It just depends upon your definition of a lot. There <laughs> are a couple hundred, maybe more. But, you know, again... It's a, it's a function of us. It's made more difficult by the fact that we don't know how many men were killed at the battle. And we don't have exact records of who died in the battle and then who died in a hospital mm -hmm. afterwards. And, you know, also soldiers were taken to Harrisburg and died and Philadelphia and Baltimore and, you know, all yeah. over the place. So it's, it's difficult because our numbers aren't exact. Okay. Uh, you, you agree? Yeah, I agree that there probably are Confederates still buried on the battlefield and probably some Union soldiers that would never be found. Very right. good possibility. Yeah. But we definitely know that there's not a mass grave underneath the tree beside the coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Or maybe we don't know. <laughs> oh. Right, right. Well, well, we'll have to just take that ghost tour and find out for ourselves. Robert? Just, just one more quick thing, I think. Because yeah. uh, I did ask about the Evergreen Cemetery as well, and it occurs to me we ought to have these gentlemen and Deb Novotny here too. Sure. Sometime for sure. one of these to of course. maybe focus in on the. I've Evergreen got her card Cemetery. on my desk. All right. I'll send awesome. her an email. That would be a great one. Um, so I was walking around there yesterday too, and, and of course going all over the place trying to pick out my grave maybe. But <laughs> I was by the Civil War section, and I was explaining to my friend that, uh, I, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but that these would be people whose loved ones had come and had paid the Evergreen Cemetery to have their loved ones interred there. I'm right so far? So what surprised me was I found one unknown. Do you know why? I mean, was this gratis or what? Well, it would have to be. Who I was just going to say, perhaps someone found that one unknown soldier, or that one unknown soldier was in their yard, and they wanted that soldier removed. Mm. Someone, let me just tell you this. So we have burial permits. Someone has to pay the $2 permit fee for a soldier to be buried in there. Okay. Uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, Thorne was burying was soldiers in the cemetery, but she wasn't just randomly going around and picking up soldiers <laughs> and burying them. Right. They were soldiers who someone paid the burial permit fee for them to be buried there. So okay. those are the soldiers she buried. So, um, mm -hmm. and I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but about 90 soldiers are buried in our cemetery initially. About 30 of them were later removed and then reburied in the National Cemetery when the National Cemetery hmm. was established. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I've always wondered, did McConaughey give back the two dollars? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I'm sure he right. didn't. I, I, and a, I was just... He probably charged him another two dollars to excavate them and remove them. <laughs> <laughs> I was theorizing with my friend, perhaps someone who had their own son re interred there maybe had this unknown body that was next to him. I mean, two dollars if you're a wealthy New Yorker who's doing this maybe they just said hey, can you bury this one too i don't know but um, well there are two brothers buried um side by side in that civil yeah. war section in the greenly mm -hmm. yeah greenly one is killed here at gettysburg and then his other brother is killed at hall shop, hall shop. Right. Good. Oh, yeah. in 64 right. Mm -hmm. right yep um and over county roy uh bob mentioned you have a book what's the name of your book uh, it has a very catchy title <laughs> Gettysburg National Cemetery. Wow. Where'd you come up with that one? Oh, I know. It's out of <laughs> but it's out of print. Oh. But I am in the process of revising it, actually tripling the size of it. Oh, nice. And hopefully next year it'll be hopefully out. Okay. So people might be able to find it used, but right now, like, they can't get it on Amazon nope. or anything like nope. that? No. Nope. Okay. So we just got to look for the new edition next Hopefully year maybe. Be coming out, right. All right. Well, let us know so that we could let the audience know. Um, this was great. I love, this was very fascinating. I'm, I love this one. Um, now I want to go over to the cemetery. So 
Uh, thanks for doing this, Roy. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you, Tim, as always. Bob, as always. Thank Peggy, you. thanks for uh, coming and watching. And Eric, thank you. And uh, everybody in the audience, uh, as always, if you want to take a tour with any of these guides, uh, just shoot me an email. Of course, now, during the quarantine, you can't quite do that. But hopefully, if you listen to this after the quarantine is lifted and things go back to normal, we can do that. And I'll uh, get you in touch with them if you want to do that. Otherwise, thank you all. Hope you're doing well. And take care. Bye-bye.